Welcome to Harvest to Pour, the business of beverages, with your host, Matthew Schiff. This is the podcast for all of those who are involved in the agriculture all the way to the distribution of beverages. And now your host, Matthew Schiff. Hello and welcome to Harvest Support. I'm your host, Matthew Schiff, and today I am here with Chris Tunstall, co-founder of A Bar Above, where they make craft cocktail skills accessible to everyone everywhere. How are you doing today, Chris? Good, Matthew. Great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thanks for, ha- thanks for coming out and talking to me. So just t- tell us, can you give us a brief overview of, of uh, A Bar Above and kind of your story behind that, how you got that started, how... What, what inspired you to, to make a bar above? Yeah, I think the kind of the birth of a bar above really started when I started attending bar. So I started off as a craps dealer in Vegas back in the 90s and 2000s, and I loved it. I was a craps dealer, which, you know, if anybody is familiar with craps, it's where you throw the dice and it's very exciting and there's a bunch of like noise and chaos. And But the thing I love about craps was there was a system in place on the actual game. No matter how much excitement, no matter how much money was on the table or how much was going on around you, our job was to focus on the system of the game. So, you know, you could thrive in chaos because of that system. And I really, really enjoyed it. But I moved to California and I removed myself from that environment and I was looking for a substitute. And the thing that kind of naturally popped up And it's kind of that excitement that I was looking for was bartending. So I started attending bar and once again, it's that excitement. It's that thrill. It's the noise. It's the party. It's being in the middle of that tornado of chaos, but having the systems in place to control it. So I really, really enjoyed it. And when I got into it, this is when the cocktail revolution had just started. There was about 10 people, five people in New York five people in San Francisco, and they were talking about all of these crazy old school cocktails, reviving them, moving away from sweet and sour, using fresh juices, and applying some really cool innovative techniques to the world of cocktails. And this was right in the beginning. So I don't know how I got on. It was on like a website called Chowhound or, you know, something like that. And I started paying attention to this. I'm like, this is going to blow up. This is going to be big. I need to really learn what it means to make culinary cocktails. And it was a lot harder than I expected. So this was back in like 2003, I started attending bar. And there was a lot of trial and error I had to do. And I was up in Napa at the time running beverage programs. And, you know, after a couple of years, I really thought I knew what I was doing. But I knew that if I wanted to kind of progress through my career, I needed to either go to New York or I needed to go to San Francisco. That I just didn't get the access to the information I was looking for in the small town. So then I moved to San Francisco and once again, I thought I knew what I was doing and I quickly found out I didn't know what I was doing. The gap between me and where everybody was operating in San Francisco was the Grand Canyon. So the, the frustrating part for me was like getting in there and really looking to learn. Like I have a thirst to learn. I love learning. And, you know, I'd be asking these questions and nobody would want to share. It was at this time, it was very early on in, you know, the mixology scene with air quotes there. And everybody was very much being a gatekeeper of information, you know, and the worst part about it was like, if you were making it old fashioned, they would ridicule you because you were doing it wrong. Right. But then they would never teach you the right way to do it. So there was real, a lot of frustration around the process of learning because nobody was helping. And I found that incredibly frustrating. And after I started looking at it from more of a scientific perspective, because we talked about, you know, our backgrounds a little bit before I went to school for microbiology. So I'm like, okay, well, let's start working on these variables. And right. once I started diving into that, I realized that even though they were preaching their way, it wasn't always the best way. And so it became inc- incredibly frustrating. So then I kind of decided like, this is ridiculous. You know, people in Kansas city or people in the middle of nowhere or, you know, small towns, they're not going to get access to this information because everybody is so siloed. Why don't we start communicating this out to the world and helping people understand why we're doing what we're doing? So, you know, I, I started 
with the idea that I'm going to do DVD box sets, because up to this point, that's what you did. If you were a flair bartender, I know this is how old school I am. Wow. If, if you wanted to learn flair bartending, the only way to do that was through DVD box sets. So I'm like, okay, there's a business model there. Let's follow that business model. And then I met my wife, girlfriend at the time. And she's like, have you heard of YouTube? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, why don't we give it away for free? And I was like, are you kidding me? And it was the best decision I ever made, both first that, but also marrying her because she is, you know, I do the creative side of the business and she does the operation side and we're a that's pretty nice. great team together. But that's kind of where a lot of a bar above was really formed and kind of the, I guess the crucible of it was really about the frustration of learning and really developing my skills and communicating and sharing that. So a lot of a bar above was really to appease my frustration as an early bartender. It's kind of like the gift I'm giving to myself back then, right? And making education much more approachable. So that was kind of the, the start of it. And then we added bar tools into our lineup because everybody just kept asking about it. Like, hey, you know, you guys are doing a great job communicating all these techniques. We trust you and all that. Who do you recommend for bar tools? And at the time on Amazon, there was only two Boston shakers, full metal Boston shakers, and they didn't work together. For anybody that's not familiar with a Boston shaker, it's, you know, the two metal cups that join together, not the cobbler shaker, which is the three piece that always freezes on you. So that's what we want. Touch your hand. I gashed my hand on one of those real good. So yeah. 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 It, it is a very frustrating tool to use, especially at volume. So we decided to do that. And at the time, Amazon was the only place or another company, which was doing really great stuff. But unfortunately, their customer service was, I'm not even going to say how bad it was, but it really, once again, frustrated me that these people are serving hospitality, but they are not exhibiting hospi hospitality to us. So then we decided like, hey, you know, nobody else is going to solve this problem. Let's do it. So then we launched the bar tool company back in like 2015 with our cocktail shakers and had 120 day lead times on them, you know, put the last of our money into it and sold out in 30 days. Wow. So that's, we're like, okay, crazy. this is it. We're pivoting. And then after that, the bar tools have been kind of the cornerstone of our company. That is a great story. No, I like the fact that you said you kind of said they were siloing all this information. So you just kind of went in to settle back into that scientific background of asking those questions, setting a few what ifs and testing those out. Now I'm assuming even though mm -hmm. you found out that they may have not been doing it right, there's a better way to do it that even though you tested these out and found better ways to do it, that you were still, that they would still criticize that method, even though you came out with a better product in the end. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is, you know, there's, this is something that we see a lot in restaurants is just that tribal knowledge that gets passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't look at it through the lens of like, you know, improvement or what if, or challenging those assumptions, they just do what everybody else has taught them to do. So, and you know, like I said, they, they were very siloed and they didn't question it. And so when I started questioning it and saying, Hey, what about this? What about that? It was mm -hmm. immediate pushback. And, you know, like I said, since it is siloed, yeah. then you're on the French. You're not part of the cool kids. And I'm like, okay, I've never been cool, so I don't mind. You know, I've yeah, kind, kind of been a dork my whole life and I'm okay with that. But yeah, it, it very much was a, a frustrating process to learn the art of cocktails and the art of what we called mixology at the time. Wow. So, but yet you, you overcome that and then putting that on the YouTube, how being, like you said, you were convinced that why don't we just give it away? How was that received early on? Well, whenever you are, are breaking down barriers and stuff, you're always going to get pushed back. And not only that, but in this time, everybody thought they knew everything. And, you know, I try to approach it very, hopefully sharing just what ifs, right? Like I might not know the answers, but let's figure this out together. So there, there were a lot of attacks, a lot of trolls in the beginning, and you just kind of have to roll with the punches and, you know, Whenever you create something and put it out into the world, you know, however you do that, you're always a little sensitive to, you know, your feedback sometimes. So early on, I got a little bit, you know, a little hot under the collar on some of the, the comments that were left on YouTube. And after a while, I'm like, it doesn't bother me. Like you have your method. I have my method. 
you know, the, the reality is the answer is probably somewhere in the middle and I'm glad we're having this dialogue. Like I never thought about that. So really taking in the positive aspect of it. And I think that really helps to build community because the last thing I want to do is reflect that negative energy back on somebody, right? Because then that's going to really start to entrench people positions and the conversation is no longer a conversation. It is, there's nothing, there's no value that you can have out, out of that. So I really tried to dismiss the negativity, embrace the conversation at the heart of what they're trying to get to and explore it together. But yeah, it was, it was challenging in the first couple of years. And then after people understood what we were trying to do, they were much more acceptable and receptive to kind of what we were trying to do. Awesome. So I want to get back now. I just want to, I wanted to dig into that a little bit, but it, it kind of helped guide you towards your tool development. Mm -hmm. What were some of your, you know, major challenges? What, what brought up, you said you want to design these tools. And I really like this, the term you brought up, you want to be a hospitality service, but also demonstrate hospitality within, within your company doing that and something that was missing. How do you reflect that in the tools you create? So whenever, like even with cocktails and creating cocktails and going through the process of making these extravagant cocktails, I think when we first started off in the world of mixology back in 2000s, it was very much about me as a bartender. The, the, the spotlight was, I'm a mixologist, and that's where a lot of the negativity really comes from, from that work. And the way I view it is more along the lines of, it is a form of customer service. So... In my mind, mixology is all the work, all the preparation that goes into developing a cocktail before somebody walks in the door, right? It's all the education. It's all the techniques that you're learning, all the history that you're putting into there, all the creativity that you're trying to match your cocktail to the environment and your guests. That is what I consider mixology. So when people walk in the door, that hat goes away and now I'm a bartender. So I am focused primarily on bartending. But when I go through the art or when I go through the process of developing cocktails, it's through the focus and the lens of customer service, right? That is the focus mm -hmm. in hospitality. So everything I look at is through that lens. Now, when we translate that to bar tools, this is also how I look at bar tool development. So when we go in to make a better cocktail shaker or when we go in to make a better tool, most of our tools are not just off the shelf tools. I look at it through the lens of customer service and how I can help that bartender achieve whatever they want to achieve. So if my tool breaks on you on a Friday night in the middle of service, I have failed you from a customer service perspective, right? So mm -hmm. that's how I look at it. I want to increase capabilities and I want to increase durability. So that way, when you buy our tools, they are not going to break on you. They are going to last a long time and you're going to be more efficient with your build process because of it. So. Not only that, but on the back end, if somebody says like, Hey man, I really need this tool or I really want this tool. It is a conversation now. It's a dialogue like, cool. Tell me more about that. You know, if there's something wrong with our tools, tell me more about that. Like we are very, very diligent about two things in our company, quality and customer service. So, and that mm -hmm. takes all the forms that we've kind of discussed and many, many other forms too. Absolutely. That's great. So we're going to move into the, my little harvest to pour journey. So, and we're going to take a little twist on this. So mm -hmm. typically if I'm talking to somebody who is producing a beverage, I'm asking them about where they're sourcing their materials from to create their beverage and how they make theirs uniquely theirs. And the pour goes into the marketing and how you get your customers to show up and come back. In your mm -hmm. case, I'm curious, we're going to start from the harvest from a mixology standpoint. And then we're going to go into the pour, kind of answering that where you started asking the question, I can make better tools for this. And so kind of transition right. into that. And the pour is how you have your, I think, music, your e-com sites, the bar above, mm -hmm. where that brings people back. Does that make sense? Yep. I believe okay. so. All right. So from that, we're going to start with the harvest. So the harvest in your case is sourcing, well, all these lovely bottles you have behind you. The, the, the education it takes to know what to pull from the shelf and what to mix. Where does, where does that come from? Where do you, what do you look for when you, when you start to, when you decide, you know, what bottle to pull, what bottle to buy? Yeah. So I think this all goes back to kind of the foundation of our company and that is through education. Back in 2014, 
I had this vision, like one of the original visions of a bar above was to create this kind of encyclopedia of cocktail theory, right? Like how to construct a cocktail from scratch, take flavors you have in your mind, which is very applicable to what we were, what we're talking about now. And how do you implement that into a cocktail in a really delicious way? So, and this was the original DVD box set that I was hinting yeah, at earlier, sure. but so in 2014, we started creating the mixology certification that we launched. And this is basically a breaking down of every single variable that you're going to use in a cocktail. And I mean everything. So mm -hmm. for example, it's a nine week course. If you take it at a wow. respectable rate, there's tests along the way. And at the end, there's a final exam and you have to do an actual practical cocktail development where you take one cocktail and you take it through three different evolutions through technique to come up with your own cocktail. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a really hard course, but the way it is structured is we identify all the variables inside of the cocktail, everything from your acid to your base spirit, sweetener, you know, emulsifiers, mixers, the glassware, the ice, the garnish. And we take all the way down to the deepest dive that we can possibly go with. So I'll give you an example of kind of the fanaticalism that we hit out with our education here. So the very first chapter is from my, from my recollection is acid. And there's some common acids that we use in bar. We use lemon lime primarily for the acid power, the pH, just, I need straight acid to offset sweetness. But then you also have cranberry, you also have orange and you also have pineapple. And those other ones have a lot more sweetness and a lot less acid. Mm -hmm. So the pH is very, you know, it's a little bit richer of a style of acid. Then we kind of take it down to the next level of like, okay, if you're not going to be using those traditional acids, what else is available? Verjou comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Vinegars come to mind, right? And how wow. do you utilize those in cocktails in order to achieve the goal that you're trying to achieve? But then we go even further down that rabbit hole and say, okay, cool. If you don't want to do that, let's talk about refined acids. Let's talk about citric acid, tartaric acid, malic acid, and how they show up in cocktails and how you can start to engineer the pH acidity of a lime, but maybe we're using Bordeaux, right? So you have that punching power of acid of lemon lime, but you have all the background flavor of a Bordeaux. That's going to transform any cocktail you touch just with that one variable. Then we do the same thing for sugars. Then we do the same thing for spirits. Then we do the same thing for every possible combination of ingredients that go through that cocktail making process and how it impacts the final cocktail. And then we start teaching about cocktail families. Like lemonade is basically a sour. You have acid, you have sweetener, and you have base spirit. It is a formula. Once you have that formula down with all the other information that we talked about with the acid, with the syrups, and now with the base spirits, you can create thousands of different variations of that one formula based up all the other information. So when we take a look at creating cocktails for media, for example, for Instagram, for TikTok, for YouTube, mm -hmm. we already have that structure in mind, right? We start at the, the cocktail family level, and then we start to introduce compelling ingredients, right? Flavor combinations that might be novel and start to tie those together. So that's kind of how we start with cocktails. Hopefully that answered the question on that. Nah, that, that was great. I, I really get in the th thing I geek out about is just mapping these processes and seeing and understanding. And I like really making these things visual. I'm sitting here like just biting at the bit. <laughs> I can't, you're talking too fast, but for me to do that, but just writing all that down where all of that goes, you, get, you actually established a backbone and then off that backbone comes all the potential. That is right. That is great. And I, I love doing that for businesses, but I, I've never thought about doing that for a mixology or, or just that's it's, it's, and it makes sense. And from coming from almost a chemistry scientific background, this really does make sense the way and I'm sure this, does this play into the way you started breaking things down for yourself way back when, when you were trying to learn, learn the art. So I think this is kind of where that started from in right. the beginning, I was just throwing booze in a glass with a the theory, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have these mm -hmm. flavor combinations I want to do not knowing the techniques that would really showcase those ingredients the best. And I threw mm -hmm. away cases and cases and cases of alcohol going through this discovery process. And it wasn't until I read, gosh, what book was that? This one here. Jerry Thomas's 
Bartender's Guide. This is the oldest cocktail book. I think it was like 1800s, 1887. Oh, wow. And he doesn't specifically say cocktail families, but he shows you how to use a cocktail family. So it was really like, this is it. And once mm -hmm. I identified that, of course. everything else fell into place. Wow. All right. No, that, that was so, great. Yeah. Go ahead. And then kind of with the education, what we really want to do is not tell people how to do it, provide them with a skeleton and let them be creative to do their own. And this is kind of that launching plot for that. Oh, yeah, that's, that matches beautifully with what I, 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 when I do things for, for beverage industries, I, I, they tell me their challenge and I create a structure for them as a guide, but it's flexible. It breathes It makes, it lets them be the curator of of their challenge in problem solving. And you've really allowed that. And you're kind of the curator of people's own creativity. They just have something to loosely hold on to and go from there. That is, that is a great teaching. I like that. Let's go into now. So you've got, you, you have the formula, you have the way to create this. And now you're starting to see a need for really good tools and access to these mm -hmm. tools. And this is where we're kind of going to get into the creation of what was yours. You started getting into creating tools for the, your, the barware, where did you start seeing that? And what were the challenges around creating this, creating your, your own barware? Yeah, the, the, the challenge was, was and is considerable. I'll be honest with you. Once again, it started with frustration, you know, tools breaking in my hand Friday night and the customer service okay. guy and it was terrible. So that's where we went to answer it. And so when we started this process, it was about, okay, how do we make our tools better? So you know, being behind the bar for 15 years, I've broken every tool there is to break. I know where those stress points are and I know how, where the, where they will break and why. So knowing that knowledge and knowing kind of what I would love to see, then we go about kind of identifying the same variables like, okay, materials and processes and, you know, what would my ideal outcome look like? So whenever you pick up a, a bar tool from a bar above, it may look like every other bar tool on the planet, on Amazon, wherever you're sourcing your bar tools, but I guarantee you there is something that you're not noticing about it that makes it better, that makes it more durable. So for example, cocktail shakers, very ubiquitous. Everybody probably has a set. They probably have multiple sets. But if you look at the bottom of a cocktail shaker and you oftentimes see three little dots that hold the weight together and I'll grab one here just for us to kind of really show me that. So this is the weight inside. You can see the weight at the very bottom of it is a big circle. And usually you see three dots that attach that weight to that shaker. And that is the only thing that holds it together. When wow. you start banging these cocktail shakers together and you're doing a thousand, you know, a couple hundred cocktails a night, for example, that's going to take a lot of beating. And then that is where it's going to fail. So when, and underneath it is rusty and gross and it's not polished. It's just, you, you have to throw them away at that point. So yeah. what we do, and you can't even see it unless you're looking for it, is we weld the whole thing shut. It is completely okay. welded to the frame. So that is incredibly durable and it's never going to break on you. When we launched the first set of cocktail shakers, I gave it to one of my buddies in Florida and we launched with a weighted, unweighted shaker. So wow. one side is weighted, the large side is weighted, the small side is unweighted. And I'll tell you why that is in a second, but I gave it to him and I said, do me a favor, beat these up, take them out first and let me know your feedback. About a year ago, he sent them back to me and he said, these are the best shakers I've ever used. And one finally failed on me. And I think he got like seven and one of them out of seven failed. And so he sent it back to me. I'm like, give it to me. I want that ba back. And he's like, okay. Yeah. He said it made a hundred thousand cocktails. And if it was the weighted weighted shaker, he would still be using that to this day. I think the other seven sets are still being used to this day after a hundred thousand cocktails. So. We really take this, the quality very seriously because once mm -hmm. again, I don't want your, our, our, our products to fail on you. Now, when it comes to the shaker itself, one other, a couple other variables here, we have two different sets. We have a weighted weighted where the small one is weighted as well and a weighted unweighted. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason we have two is that when we have the weighted unweighted, the one with the weight, the large one is very rigid. You can't really flex that very much, but the weighted mm -hmm. unweighted is very flexible. So you can bend it and it has much more flex than the other one. So why this is important is when you go to seal this shut, mm -hmm. 
the unweighted conforms to the weighted and creates a very, very tight seal. And this is important when you shake egg white cocktails because the gases inside of the egg white or the, the shakers start to build up and it builds pressure inside of here, kicking out the other tin. So this is why this is really good. The weighted unweighted is great for egg whites. The weighted weighted tuber structures is much easier to open. So for high volume bars, that's what we would recommend is a weighted weighted. So like this level of detail, just like our course, we go down the rabbit hole for every bar tool that we offer and try to make it different and special. And with that working knowledge of me and another bartender, we have a combined, you know, work experience of over 30 years in the industry before we even started developing tools though. Yeah. And the, the colors that we use are dishwasher safe. And I think we're one of the only ones in the industry that have a, that in, in our tools. So yeah, we, we really take it very seriously. We have a lot of fun, but we do take tool mm-hmm. development very seriously. So are there any challenges around craft, like building the tools or when you start concepting out your tools and stuff and where, where, where are some of those challenges lie before you know you can release it or is it going to work or is it not going to work? Yeah. So well, a lot of that is just development. It takes a long time to develop these tools. There's a lot of back and forth. So we source in, in China because most of the stainless steel in the world is being manufactured in China. So the lag time between development and production is considerable. So some of the tools that we offer have taken three years for us to develop. So that's a considerable amount of investment from a time side and just a development side. So that has been a significant challenge. And, and I think the other thing is just the copycats. Like we were the first one to release a weighted on weighted shaker on Amazon. There's thousands of them now. So, you know, that has always been a, a bit of a challenge and a bit of a frustration, but you know, we have our own message. We have our own brand to stand behind. And, uh, you know, I think, I think we do a good job as far as that goes. But those are the main challenges we have regarding kind of development and tools. It's just that lag time production times 120 days, like I mentioned. So just being on top of our inventory, having everything on stock, it does take a lot of planning, a lot of process. We have some amazing people on our team that do a fantastic job at that. So we're very lucky on that regard. I think that part of that could work as a strength, the fact that letting people know that it took three years of research and development to develop a high quality product that you have really, you know, speaks to the passion you have behind this product. Yeah, absolutely. And just how do we differentiate from everybody else that looks exactly like us, but isn't yeah. quite the same? Yeah, that's, that's mm-hmm. definitely part of that mix as well. Oh, yeah. All right. So we're going to move on to the pour and the pour is mm-hmm. kind of your marketing, your piece, how you get people to know about you. I mean, you, you said you launched with your first product and it went really fast. I can't remember how many, how fast you said it went, but it was fast. Mm-hmm. What, what you have courses, you have education, what brings people back to you? So especially, you know, if you're making such a good product that never breaks, that could, that could turn into a unique problem all of itself. I, I would call it the Cub Cadet yeah, problem. Very much is. It's a lo- the lawnmower company that almost put themselves out of business because they really, such a reliable product and nobody came back to replace them. Yeah, that's very much a problem we have too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so as far as the question goes, the, how do we get people to come back, right? Mm-hmm. So yes. we are constantly developing new tools. So we probably launched... 20 something new SKUs last year, color variations and different tools. So we're constantly in product development. So that is one major way that we are getting people to come back. It's just building exciting new products. The other thing is we are starting to take a look at kind of what I would call crossover categories, things that are, can be considered cocktail related, but also crossover into a much broader category of like kitchen utensils. That opens up a brand new market for us, establishes us as a credible brand in that space and pulls people into our brand as well. So trying to look at different ways of getting bigger market share through bigger audiences and pulling them into our brand. That's another way that we're doing it. And to be honest with you, I think YouTube and the length of time that we've been on YouTube has really, really helped us as far as like solidifying who we are as a brand, being able to really communicate, you know, the value of our tools, the value of our education, and just building passionate, passionate people. That has been absolutely tremendous. We've done podcasts. I mean, if we've, if it has been a thing in the e-commerce space, we've probably done it at some point. So yeah, we have, let's see, YouTube, we have the online courses, podcasts. We did 215 episodes. 
We have two Facebook communities. There's there's no shortage of, of we're on TikTok, we're on Instagram, we're, we're on everything. Um, I'm glad we didn't go in the clubhouse because my understanding is that's no longer a relevant social platform. But uh, but yeah, we yeah. If, if if it hits max, you know, a critical mass, we're probably on that platform in some, some way. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So how much does your, you've obviously grown quite, quite the community and the following YouTube and such. How much does the community influence your next tool you make? A lot. I mean, it really does help having that community behind us. Sometimes I'll go into like, if I'm having a, a trouble really conceptualizing the direction on a tool or a new product or something, we have two different communities. One is craft cocktail club and the other one is a craft bartender community. So the craft cocktail club is very much enthusiast space and, you know, people that are just really passionate about cocktails. So if it's something I'm really designing for them, I'll ask them like, Hey guys, what do you, what would you like? You know, I'm, I'm going to develop this tool. Tell me what you would love to see in this. On the bartender community, I do the same thing. Like if I'm doing industry specific tools. I'm going to ask the industry like guys, you know, this is what I'm, I'm thinking. What would you prefer? Like we did this with the bar spoons, for example. I'm like, do you like 12 inches? Do you like 15 inches? Do you like 17 inches? What's your preferred um, size and why? And so we get a lot of feedback from our community and we really do try to engineer and create tools for them because I'm only one person and I have my own thoughts and, you know, what I would love to see. But I think if we are going to be a successful tool company, we really do have to listen to the bigger audience and really take all their considerations into account when we, when we do this. And once again, this is a form of community building. This is a form of customer service for me. Like listening to them is something that I don't think any other bar tool company does is active listening. That's awesome. And you're using them as your testing base too, and suggestions and, and just development. That's great. Right. So segueing from that, obviously the community has influence on you and your business. Where do you want to take your business next? That's a really good question. So we love this business. It's my wife and I, we work on this business and it is, you know, our third child. So we want to continue to grow this business. We want to continue to develop really great tools, supporting our community, providing education for anybody that is interested in learning more about cocktails. So we have a very long roadmap of things that we want to develop. And our problem isn't what to do next. Our problem is what do we really want to do and what makes the most sense for our business? Like, well, I just did our tool development, product development for this year, and there's probably 200 items on there I could develop. Wow. So the shortage, there's no shortage of product development that we could do. Mm -hmm. Same thing with courses. Last year we launched four courses, I want to say, and we have concepts for, you know, it depends on where we want to take it. We could do small courses, we could do you know, more on the mixology side, we haven't even started talking about the professional development side, like, you know, how to run a bar, how to do the numbers, how to do this, how to become a consultant, how to start your own bar. Like the, the, there is no end in sight as far as what we can do. And I think the really right. powerful thing is when we tie those things together, right? We offer some of the best barware in the world, and we're going to show you how to run your business, or we're going to show you how to up your game in cocktails. Like those two things together are incredibly powerful. And so when we, when we look at the long-term vision of this company, mm -hmm. that's where we go. That's where we're headed is that's, that's kind of our vision is like, let's just keep going. Let's keep developing and getting our brand out there and becoming the main bar tool company that everybody just kind of trusts. All right. And if there's anybody, you've been in this a while now, if there's anybody, that, mm -hmm. an entrepreneur out there that wants to get into your world or start their own beverage education or even their own bar, what would, what advice would you have for them right now? I think be patient, like learn everything you can learn on somebody else's dime. Like, and you know, if you're looking to open your own business, you gotta be a manager. You gotta understand the financial side of running your company and being responsible for the bottom line and, you know, really helping to deliver on profitability. So if you're looking to own your own company, learn on somebody else's dime. Don't make those mistakes on your own, on your own money. Be patient because, you know, those overnight successes that we all hear about are 10 years in the making. It doesn't happen overnight, right? So you got to put your yeah, time yeah. in, you got to learn, you got to take, take on mentors, like find people that you can ask and bounce ideas off. Like we probably have. 10 mentors that we've talked to over the, over the years, and each one has been incredible in their own way. 
We've hired consultants that have really kind of held our hand along the way. And I know that's something you do. And I cannot, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a good consultant is worth their weight in gold. Mm -hmm. A bad consultant right. can suck your business dry. Yes. So, you know, find good partners that can help lead the way to the next step in your business. So those are some things that I would recommend. And also, if you're going to be the figurehead of the company and you got to learn people, you got to learn how to manage people. You got to learn how to yes. influence people, motivate people, get them excited and all that. And this is still a learning journey for me, but my wife is exceptional at it. She has created a company that that's people don't leave. One of the things that's really interesting about our company, and it's a little bit off topic, but I think it does really play into our culture of the company itself is my wife is the visionary of the company, the structure of the company and the company that we have created. And from the get go, you know, she wanted a company that she was proud to work at. And so we've instituted some really interesting things like a 30 hour work week. Mm -hmm. That is maximum. That's not a minimum. So if you work for our company, you get full benefits at 30 hours a week. You have a nine to 12 work schedule and whatever you want to do after that is up to you. So you're very flexible in that regard, right? And the caliber of people that come to our company is incredible. It, I, I, awesome. I promise you, it's, it's, we're hiring people 10 times above our weight class and they don't leave. Awesome. It's fascinating. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's actually very much on topic here. Not even close because this is the, my goal here with this podcast is to have other people, other owners share their wins, their failures, their lessons learned and learn from each other collectively. So that is, or okay. even somebody coming into startup. So that is very valuable information. I thank you very much for offering that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, no, definitely. And actually yeah, talking about people, you're, you're right. I, I came from a laboratory, so I was a recluse with a pipette and now I have to learn how to build a business, talk to people <laughs> and all while, all while, all while flying this plane. So absolutely, I, yep. I, I hundred percent agree. All right. Now comes the, I'm really going to be interested in your answer to this question. It's, it's hard for some, it's easy for others, but this one's going to be unique. What is your okay. favorite beverage? Mm. Mm. So or you could put, like, I think what's your favorite beverage on the bar? What's your favorite beverage when you're out and about? So they're, they're just kind of like whenever you go out to eat, you know, you really want to lean in on what their specialty is, right? I want to experience food and drink through somebody else's lenses. You know, I want to see what they're passionate about. I want to see what they bring to the table because, you know, I want that conversation. I want that, that insight into how they think about cocktails and food and hospitality. Like that is more interesting to me than the liquid that's in front of me. Right? So if I go to a bar and I have a conversation with a bartender and if it's an appropriate time to have this conversation, I will. I'll ask them like, Hey man, what are you excited about these days? You know, you just can't spring that on somebody on a Friday night, but if it's on a Tuesday and you have a little bit of a rapport that you built up, then you can start to have this conversation like, all right, so what are you excited about right now? Like what spirits are you drinking? Like what, what do you want to do with that? Like I'm, I'm a guinea pig. Show me what, show me what excites you. I want to experience your vision in my glass. Like that is cool to me. So I think that is the thing I am, that, that's my favorite beverage is like seeing that spark of creativity, seeing that excitement in somebody else's eyes, it's contagious and I'm going to be excited about that as well. So that's usually how I approach food, wine, yeah. cocktails. Like I, I hate making decisions. So I'll ask the server, <laughs> like, this okay. is, this is your, this is your specialty, right? You, you live and breathe this menu every single day. What is, what are you excited about? I can get weird. Like, don't like anything on the menu. Tell me what awesome. you want. Tell me what you would order if you're me and what wine would you pair with it or what cocktail? Okay. And it's always good. Yeah. So I knew this would be a unique answer. I've never had an answer like that. And I knew this one would be a good, so I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> yep. So do you have, I know you have courses, you have, do you have any like promotions or anything coming up that you, that you, you know, want to talk about real quick? or just to briefly take us through what value somebody can get from your courses. Sure. So before I kind of go into the courses and other things, 
One of the things I want to talk about real quick is the amount of energy that goes into a podcast like this. We did 215 episodes on our end, and I know how much goes into it. So for anybody that is listening, um, if you're enjoying this podcast and he's doing a hit, I love the format of this. We talked about this before. It's fantastic. Please leave a review. Reviews really are so helpful in the space of creating information and creating podcasts and creating materials. That feedback is absolutely really beneficial and it doesn't, it takes you nothing, right? So please leave a review for the, for any podcast that you're listening to, definitely specifically this one. Now, as far as the promotions go for us and kind of some of the things that we have on our end, you know, we, we offer a really extensive lineup on our courses. The mixology certification is one thing that we talked about, but I think we're up to like eight courses now. And one of the things that we just finished off is a series on flavor manipulation, where we go through some really advanced techniques, starting very simple and gradually building up the kind of the, the education, the techniques on that specific topic. So within a flavor manipulation series, we have an entire course built on just syrups, standard syrups to advanced syrups. Same thing with infusions, standard infusions to really advanced intricate infusions. And the same thing that we just launched on the bitters and tinctures side, how to get really targeted with your flavors through creating tinctures and bitters. And the cool thing about it is we take three common cocktails through the entire series to show you what the effect is on different techniques. So for example, the syrups gives you a nice big rich flavor right in the beginning, but quickly dies off. With infusions, you have a much longer tasting experience and that flavor just develops longer on your palate over time. And then with the tinctures and bitters, bitters really does help to kind of bring everything together. It's like the glue from a flavor perspective, but also tinctures give you a highly targeted flavor that you could just, it's like a scalpel inserting it into a cocktail. So if you're interested in more advanced techniques, I would highly recommend that. So, but there are a lot of courses and I highly recommend taking a look at them. Do you mind if I plug our website real quick as well? Yeah, I was just going to, I was just going to ask that question. Feel free. Okay. So yeah, if you're interested, head on over to shop.abarabub.com. You can take a look at our tools and you can take a look at the courses that we offer as well. And since we are based in customer service, if you have any question, we're going to answer you pretty quickly. <laughs> awesome. That is great. Hi, Chris. This has been a awesome interview. I have learned a lot about just about, well, just about cocktails and mixology and the tools and, and the, you know, having the right tool for the job and a good tool for the job and the beating these things take and the problem you saw and the problem you solved. But it was really great learning about just, again, your service and hospitality and demonstrating service and hospitality to the people you serve being a big key piece, almost like a vision of your, of your business. And then your, your great story of running into these gatekeepers saying, Hey, I, I have the chops. I can solve this, figuring it out, making it your own. And then seeing that the tools that needed to be developed and, and the work and the research you put into them. And not only that, the community and the team development you've done to, you know, encourage people to want to come work for you and, and try hard for you. There is so many lessons for so many businesses, whether you're a coffee shop, winery, brewery, bar, boutique, cafe, to be learned here. Chris, I really thank you for your time. This has been really great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Harvest to Pour, the business of beverages with Matthew Shep. Check the show notes for our guest contact information and connect with Matthew Shep on LinkedIn today.